Good morning uh, to Han Wan uh, uh, from mm -hmm. uh, Singapore. So today we are very glad to have Han Wan Zhang uh, from uh, Nanyang uh, Technological uh, University. And uh, he has been well known for a lot of work on casual inference and re reasoning uh, in computer vision uh, researches. For example, the uh, visual pre-censoring, the image captioning works, and uh, even the common sense reasoning uh, works. So he is now an assistant professor from uh, Nanyang Technological University uh, School of Computer Science and Engineering. Uh, his research interests include computer vision, natural language processing, cultural inference, and uh, the combinations. So his work has received numerous uh, awards, including the IEEE's uh, Tend to Watch uh, at 2020 and the uh, uh, TMM Prize uh, Paper Award 2020 and Alibaba Innovative uh, Research Award uh, 2019, ACM2MM uh, Best Paper Award uh, 2018, and the Nanyang Assistant Professorship uh, 2018, ACM Seeger Best Paper Honorable Mention Award 2016, and ACM uh, Multimedia Best Student Paper Award 2012. So Hama and his team work actively in casual inference for connecting vision and language. For example, the SYNGRAPH detection benchmark won the HPC VPR Best Paper Finalist 2019, and the Visual Dialogue Agent won the first place in Visual Dialogue Challenge 2019, and second place in 2018 and uh, 2020. So let's welcome Han Wan uh, for the great talk. Thank you. Thanks, Jianwei, for the very nice introduction and i think i will mute myself uh not mute to yeah. disable the video to <clears throat> keep the bandwidth well uh a very good afternoon to all of you and uh thanks for inviting me to share our recent progress and Miro. and i'm not sure whether the proposed model is truly unbiased but I'm right now uh, truly unawake. So, uh, so if there are some mistakes or were, were some misunderstandings of the concept, so please don't blame me for it. Uh, yeah. And uh, for most of the works introduced today, uh, please go to our website for the papers. And I will just focus on the very high level introduction of the works. All right, so uh, this is a roadmap of our team's works and we generally follow the uh, causal ladder introduced by pearls. So we have done many works on the second run about the causal interventions. We have done future learning, vision language pre-training, Visual Commerce Sense RCN, uh, domain adaptation, uh, class incremental learning, and so on and so forth. And then we will also uh, use a lot of concepts in the counterfactuals. And for counterfactuals, we have already done works in long tail recognition, VQA change in priors, task, zero trial learning open center recognition, so on and so forth. So uh, we will continually using the uh, the concepts in causal intervention counterfactuals. And so we will first review what are the two things? What are the difference between the first level and the second and third levels? All right, so the do is the abbreviations for intervention, which is known for the pearls proposed to do operations, like when you are trying to pursue the causal effect between X and Y, we, you will always see this proper ability or the so-called intervened proper abilities, P, Y given do X. So, uh, first, they are the same uh, because both of them are manipulating the observational D 
distributions P. By observational distribution, I mean the training data, the observations of the world. And then uh, they both assume that the test P is different from the training P. This is very important because uh, sometimes when you apply or adopt some the caudal uh, methods in your training data, and sometimes you can always find that uh, you don't improve the overall prediction accuracy. Well, that's pretty normal because uh, it can only work when the test P is different from the trim P. So please consider this case. The GBP is the common cause of the, uh, the consumption of the chocolate and the number of Nobel Prize, right? So, uh, but we can always observe a positive proportions of the chocolate consumption and the number of Nobel Prize for a nation. So the common cause is your GDPs, right? So if these causal relationships do not change, then you can always make a better predictions when you uh, consider that the consumption of the chocolate is a very good index to predict the number of Nobel Prize. But when sometimes like when the scientists may discover there is a factor that may cause cancer, right, then maybe the consumption of the chocolate will decrease and people will abandon the consumption of the chocolate and then this prediction will be never robust, right? So therefore we will call the traditional prediction predictions is trying to pursue the uh, post uh, proper abilities, but the causal prediction is trying to pursue the true causal effect. And it can be also known as the robust predictions or called the stable learning. Means we want to make predictions across different environments. All right, and on the second point, uh, the do is not equal to counterfactuals. First, the do will average over different environments, means the we will need to, when we want to examine the cause of a effect, we need to perform the cost in different environments. And it means we want to do the experiments everywhere. And then and and this can be also seen from the back door, the very famous back door. So if we have the causal graph like this, this is a common cause of X and Y. So by backdoor, uh, formula, we can have this. As you can see that the pursuit of the causal effect from X to Y is indeed, a uh, average of the, uh, the, the P Y given X and Z. So it's a average expectations of the environments. And for counterfactuals, it is, uh, it will control more because it will first pause everything, unknown everything at a moment, and then perform the do, perform the interventions, and then we resume everything. And later I will show a uh, very nice videos for counterfactuals. And the do interpolates facts. It will mm, do some predictions within the facts. And 
On the other hand, counterfactuals will extrapolate the facts. It can imagine it, it but, but it will break the positivity of do. Because in the uh, traditional backdoor uh, formulas of the do operators, it will always assume that the, there must be observations of the X and D. This is called the positivities. But for counterfactuals, it does not assume such a assumption. It can always imagine it. It can extrapolate the facts. So uh, I will use the superpowers of the X men about the do and counterfactuals. So the professor X can make a very nice example of the interventions. It can um, perceive the minds of every human being in the world and then to perceive and feel the, the human feelings in every environment. And for the Quicksilver, it is a very nice example of the counterfactuals. You can enjoy this video. Hmm. How to play it? Uh, sorry, let me. Yeah, probably, Han Wan, you need to um, probably quit the uh, full screen mode and then uh, try. Full screen mode? Yeah, yeah, how about okay. you quit? Yeah. yeah, okay. This is a free set um, moment, meaning free set everything given the fact. And then you can perform the interventions. It's worth noting that the um, intervention is always based on this given moment. It does not change anything else, but the variables you're intervening. And then when you have done the interventions, you just press the re resume button. All right, so I think all of you can get the key points of do and counterfactuals. Uh, Hi, Professor right. John. Yes. Can I ask a question? Sure. So I'm really sorry for the video. I don't get where is the counterfactual. So could you explain a little bit more? And I see. This guy do some intervention and change the posture, change those stuff, and this one will have different result. And how this related to the counterfactual, I'm still confused. Uh, could you give more explanation about this? All right, counterfactuals means, uh, uh, well, when you uh, observe a fact, and then you will use this fact to solve the variables were were the the values of uh, variables like uh if you are given so a, for example uh, if that guy you know that policeman and hold the fist mm -hmm. and trying to hit someone and that guy changed the posture of that arm posture so can, could yes, you use this as an example to explain okay uh, when, when you observe that the post of the policeman right that's uh observe the fact right right and then you freeze everything you keep the all the other variables in the environment fixed and then you only intervene the values of the post 
Right. That means a do. And then you make the actions. You perform it. You resume. And then you will uh, observe a different future. Right. So That's counterfactual. So the whole thing is called counterfactual. You freeze everything and just change one thing, and you will see different yes. results. Exactly. Okay. okay, cool. Thanks. Okay, right. Thank you for your question. All right. So that that means the counterfactuals can extrapolate the facts. It's not just a replay of the facts, but it's a extrapolation, means imagination. This part I don't understand why this is called extrapolation. So extrapolation uh, means you can imagine something that never happens. But if you know all of the, for example, that person, if you, <clears throat> excuse me, if you know all of the mm -hmm. hand postures and you can predict mm -hmm. what happens, that's the interpolation. Why it's called extrapolation? Uh, well, uh, that's a different interpretations of the interpolation and extrapolations. Extrapolations means you have this trend, right? This is a trend and extrapolates means you are predicting the future from this moment. Maybe something like this. Interpolation means you have the two points right here. That's the given facts and you're predicting somewhere here. Okay, so basically here the interpolation and the extrapolation is on the time uh, time domain. It's not on the space domain. Uh, well, not necessarily. Uh, you can always extrapolate some space domain points that never exist. Well, uh, maybe you can use the uh, some other examples to understand. Maybe in this uh, vision language domains, okay? Sure. Okay, so, uh, so uh, what are the interventions and counterfactuals in the deep RC methods we have ever seen? So first, again, let's highlight that the assumption that the train and test are different. Um, basically, we uh, prefer the OD settings. And for the interventions, we have seen a lot of existing techniques that can be counterfactual sample synthesizing, the uh, counterfactual vision and language learning, and some reweighting and resample techniques in the long tail classifications. So, and then we will also focus on the, uh, the, the existing Ruby counterfactual VQA and LMH later. So for the do, uh, here are the examples. As you can see that for the interventions, we are really intervening the facts right here. So means for given this image, what color is the man's tie? And we will hide this area and we will uh, relabel that it's not green and so on and so forth. Or you can generate some counterfactuals right here. So uh, for this uh, intervene the facts, there are some drawbacks. The first is the artifacts, right? You may introduce a lot of artifacts in the images. And for this one, as you can see that the, the, the neck of this uh, giraffe is unnatural. So in the, for the counterfactuals of this debarsing methods, we can uh, uh, maintain the nature of the data, and then we will remove the undesired bias from this model. And we will have a quick introduction of this counterfactuals. 
So to understand to understand the keys of the counterfactuals, we need to review the mediation effect. So we will use this uh, survivorship bias at the examples. For these planes on the left hand side, right? So if you only consider the plane status and its safe return facts, then uh, you will find a correlation between the uh, positions of the bully host and its safe return status. The, so here is a example. If you neglect a very important mediator, the no critical hit right here, if you only observe the input and the output, you will find that most of safe returns have less holes, right? That's a fact. And only minor have more holes. And you believe that the minor is not safe compared to the majorities because on the uh, uh, airport, a lot of the majority of the planes are with less holes, not like this one, right? So you will find that the majority is safer than the minorities, and you will, of course, fortify the holes. But the conclusion is wrong because you miss the very important mediators. So if you consider the mediator explicitly, you will find that the most safe returns have no critical hits. And less critical hits means safer. So the cost of the safe returns is this variable, but not this direct effect. So you will find the critical parts like the engines, the uh, pilots, uh, and the uh, fuel tanks. And then you will, of course, fortify the intact parts. So here, 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 and here. And then you have the correct conclusions. That's called the mediation analysis. So the survivorship virus is just a very simple example showing that uh, uh, the mediator is very important. But for this case, you can simply perform the do uh, interventions for, for this mediation effect analysis. But in real cases, uh, sometimes the interventions are impossible because you cannot uh, change the physical world and sometimes it's illegal. We will use two more examples to, to see why sometimes we really need counterfactuals to do the imaginations. Well, the first example is about how to remove the placebo effect right here. So we know that when the patients take the medicine, it will make him believe that, well, this medication will, of course, cure me. So I have a positive, you know, the mood, the emotions and such emotions can help me to recover myself, right? So the placebo, the removal of this placebo is very straightforward. We can just make this zero, right? But it's impossible because if you want to make the medication as one and the placebo as zero, you have to cheat the patient that uh, you have to force uh, the patient to take the medication and does not tell the patient that you have taken it. And so this is, this cheating is illegal in pharmacy uh, research. So we have to make another minor trick. So we will uh, use some placebo medications like it's uh, just salt water, right? Or just pure water and we we'll treat the patient that you are taking the medications. And at this moment, the uh, these placebo variables will be what? Will be positive. And then this effect will be purely this path. 
And then you use this so-called the total effect to minus this uh, indirect effect. And then you will finally complete the pursuit of this medication to cure. So this is the desired path. And in fact, if you want to pursue this direct effect path, you have to minus this counter factuals means the medication is zero and the placebo is one. And another minor trick must happen when the system is nonlinear. So please consider the case of divorce, right? So uh, for most of the cases, if you want a divorce and then you just make your spouse contribution as zero, you disable your spouse contribution and then you see, okay, uh, what kind of properties you have without the help of your spouse. And then you, your case is complete. But we know that our marriage is nonlinear, right? So you will have a children. You will have kids that you, you cannot be e easily separated from, right? So for this case, how do you make the spouse is zero and you will have kids, right? When you disable any of these two variables here and here, there will be no more children. So how to keep this nonlinear nonlinear effect from this system? You will again apply the minor straight. So first you will assume that your variable is zero and the spouse is one and you can uh, obtain the pure indirect effect from here. And then you use this total effect minus this mm, indirect effect. And then you will have your desired effect, you and the property and then with the children. Okay, so in the VQA, we have published a paper called the counterfactual VQA this year. So we will follow the same trick. So for the VQA, this is a question direct bias, right? But sometimes we want the uh, the desired effect is this path. We want know the questions and the reasoned attentions and then the end answers and then we will minor that the direct language bias from here and for many deep learning based vqas these systems are nonlinear. so this miners can also preserve the good language bars by good language bars i will show a example later but you can consider that the good language bias is the nonlinear results from the system, like the children in the marriage example. So here is a example for the compared methods. As you can see that uh, this debarsing methods cannot uh, hold the uh, good language bars. As you can see that the question is, large or small, right? So you should choose one of these adjectives. So uh, so the base models can keep the language bars, but it cannot discriminate between the good and the bad. But our methods can maintain that the uh, good language bars, like the, the we indeed choose that the small all of the large or small or this one what the man about to do we prefer to use a verb right here but the compare baselines will discard this good language bars and another example Hi, about the May long term question yes sure so i i i'm i'm a little bit uh, confused about uh counterfactual and counterfactual in VQA. So what's the, so for the counterfactual, you're trying to find the causal effect. And uh, 
in the VQA, you're trying to find the causal effects. Oh, you want to leverage this to get better results. So I, I, I'm confu confused between CF and CF in VQA. Could you explain this? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How are you How confused? Are you? So VQ, what are you trying to do CF in VQA? The CF, the CF here, here is, here is minors. minors. Because, because you are creating a counterfactual world, like you uh, make the question available and then you disable the visual attention. So what do you mean minus? Could you show an example? In the VQA, how you do the minus? In the VQA, how do I do the minus? Uh, so this model is the original conventional model, like it's uh, F, Q, and image. That's okay. a full output. And then you will minus these counterfactuals, like the Q is minus, but the image and its induced visual tensions is disabled. This is a counterfactual world. And these counterfactual worlds will represent this undesired. Oh no, I'm sorry. This counterfactual world. Okay. This counterfactual world will represent this undesired direct bad language bias. Wait a second. The F is the. Neural network is a function, right? Yes. And so how come, how come it? So this is output is a distribution over the uh, dictionary, Answer. right? Okay. Answer. So, yes. So you. So what's the meaning of this? One distribution minus another distribution doesn't means is another distribution. So this is not a distribution at all, right? So what's the uh, meaning? This is not. This is the logic of the output. It's before the softmax. It's not a distribution. Okay, this is a this is a logic. Yes. So, so one logic minus another logic. That means before the softmax is the uh, logic over the dictionary. Yes. Okay. Cool. And uh, mm -hmm. so, so this is for training, or is for the inference? Inference. So basically, when you do the inference, give an image, you need to create another image, which is a C bar. Yes. So I'm not creating a uh, uh, photorealistically uh, fake image. I'm create. I'm just disable the visual attention variable. So for this model, the visual Tension is a baseline or some constant. So, so basically, your process, your pipeline is given an image and given a question. Mm -hmm. You first create another image, which is the C bar. And uh, is the C bar a function of your question or not? A C bar or is a random arbitrary uh, intervention? Arbitrary constant. What do you mean arbitrary? Is the C an image? The C is not a image. Uh, well, uh, the C bar is a representative of a zero visual attention, a muted visual attention. Where is the image? So is the VQ, is the function has- Image is input as normal. And you will calculate a visual attention given the language, right? That I don't know. And so, could you give me an example how you get a C from C to C bar, and how how this process? I'm totally confused. And uh, how this process is looks like? All right. So maybe I will rewrite this. Like, uh, in fact, for answer model, any VQA models will consider the tension inputs and the question inputs, right? 
like you have two branch. This is a Q, this is a, a tension, and this is a answer, right? And the attention is a combination of the Q and the image, right? So you can write the I and Q right here. Okay, so here it's in fact, the C will be A, A bar. A bar means you calculate the attention, but you discard it in this answer model. So does it clarify myself? No, I don't understand. How do you mean calculate the attention, but uh, do not use it? So, so you so mean the input is zero? The model on the left hand side is uh, using it's using the tension. It's a normal model, right? Right. And on the right hand side, you will uh, deliberately make the attention zero. Okay. So the model will be given into like this. Q is existing and the attention is zero. Where okay. uh, arbitrary constant, and then you will have an answer logic. So logic one minus logic two. So you throw away the image at all? You throw, throw away the entire image? So the answer is uh, completely comes from the question? You just uh, kind of completely yes. guess? I do not throw away the image, I throw away the attention. So that means the image is useless, right? Yes, yes. As a result, so that, the image is useless. So the answer is only comes from question. That's, that answer, of course, is not very good, right? Yes. Maybe 90% of the one of these sports are about tennis. So that's a pure bias. I see. So you just prior, basically. For example, if the question is, is there any person uh, in this image? You all, you just you don't even look yeah. at the image. You say yes, right? Because you assume yes. majority yes. of images have have some person in there. So you would just always say yes. Okay, so that's your that's your okay. second one. That's a F A bar Q. Basically, it's just like yeah. prior. Mm -hmm. So the first one, sort of, you look at the image, you get an answer. The second one is you don't look at the image, you get an answer. And then the the difference you think is the bias. Yes. You, that that means if any if. E, if if I'm taking exam, if I look at the, the if I look at the questions, I mean if I read the problem, then that means I'm biased. Mm -hmm. I mean, what was supposed to was supposed to read the problem? Was supposed to look at the image, but now if I look at them, mm -hmm. you are saying that I'm biased already. That that's that's a little bit counterintuitive. I don't I don't know maybe I'm, I think uh, maybe I don't understand it. You are perfectly correct. <laughs> yeah. So. Yeah. So, so uh, here I want if to. If we follow this, so let's say we have an example. Let's say what color for the banana, and uh, from the FQ probably is either green or yellow, half and half, and from the image, and you probably only also have a probably you. Let's say if you have a, a banana, two bananas, one green and one yellow, and from the uh, previous one is yellow and uh, green, half and half. And if you minus equal to zero, so that means what color for banana you minus this is nothing. Uh, hold on. If uh, let me choose another slide, maybe it illustrates better. Uh, hold on. Maybe I need to reshare my screen for this one. Uh, can you see the screen now? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Okay. So, uh, so for this example, uh, let me have this one. So here, this one is the full model. 
So it's a factual world and you will use the questions and the buyers right here. The buyers learn from the training that most bananas are yellow. And then even if you are given a green bananas, you will always output that the yellow is dominating than the green, right? So that's a logic one from the full model. And then when you mute your visual tensions means you the, the, the reasoning parts of this VQA model is disabled. You will, you will purely have this language prior like this. The yellow is dominating the gray, right? And then you will make the miners that you will have something like this. No, I'm I'm trying to understand. So this is uh, this example may not correct. So how come in the language yellow and green are different? So, so if in the language the banana is either yellow mm -hmm. or green, have the same same have the same. Uh, the quality then this field right so, so here what do you mean by in quality? the language and in the image the pro the proportion of the green and the yellow banana are different then you will see this difference but if they are the the frequency are the same and you see nothing right uh I cannot get it. Uh, oh, okay, right here. Oh, so the the green bar in this form model is a little bit longer than the green right here. Because you are, so in the factual model, in the logic one, you are indeed seeing some green images right here. So it will a little bit modify the length of the green. Well, I understand this, and but this rely on the fact mm -hmm. uh, with so with the language or without the language, their distribution are totally different. But if with the language or without the language, their distribution is almost the same. And then you don't. Yes, but the language prior distribution is almost the same. It means the yellow is dominating. This is the same. And when you minus the same thing, you will have a very small yellow. That's the mechanism of how it works. Right? The pure language bias will cause a much shorter green and the the Factual four model will have a longer green. And when you minus the same yellow, and you will have the green uh, outstanding. Okay, so uh, maybe we should have a one more session after this. We're still far, far away from our key points. Okay. Cool. Thanks. All right. So let's continue to our sweet spot of today. Uh, let me let me reshare the. Okay. Right here. Right. All right. Okay. So here is an example of the long tailed models, and they are uh, applying the same thing, but the mediator here is uh, the uh, uh, the majority of the the moments means you are when you are applying SGD on any training data, it will accumulate the majority effects from the training data. So you have to minus it. This is the mainstream and this is the, the sample specific D 
decisions. So uh, you will try to minor this mainstream and to get what the model exactly sees the 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 classification of this example. So here is a visualizations for example in the few short classes in the long tail distributions. This is the tails, right? So when you see a warhog, the baselines and another competitive compared methods will mainly focus on the peaks itself, right? But our methods can only focus on the task of this workshop, meaning we have already uh, uh, considered that the mainstream is that a workshop is a peak. And we uh, consider that this is a fact. We admit that the word talk is a peak. And then we will minor that if we discuss, we throw away the mainstream that word talk is a peak, what else we're seeing? So what else? The task. And of course, the big horn or kimono. So we only focus on the fine green class of this uh future classes well and then uh what we have discussed so far uh talking about the debiasing techniques right so this debiasing techniques like the rmh self vqa and css though they are from interventions were the counterfactuals but uh the all assume that the test distributions are different from the trainings, right? So therefore, when you are performing uh, in distribution tasks, like on the VQA V2, you can always observe that the traditional method is much higher than the debiased ones, right? So the debiased ones, although can improve the all of distribution accuracies, but it will decrease the performance on the in distribution task at the same time. So you the models where the effect of the debarsing methods are bipolar, right? So our goal is to make the best of the world. We want to uh, uh, make this debarsing methods perform consistently on the in distribution task. And on the other hand, it's about the uh, uh, Professor uh, John, could you go to the previous slides? Yep. So I saw you doing the debiasing, and what was the difference between your work and the debiasing methods? Uh, in our paper, we have discussed that uh, the Ruby LMH, the all belong to the counterfactuals, and the CSS belongs to the interventions. But your, what's the, so I'm still confused. What's the difference between the counterfactual and the debias? Uh, counterfactual is imagine, is uh, imagination of something that is not seen in the training data. So it's debiasing. So could you, could you give you an example in the VQA? Could you give me mm -hmm. an example in the VQA what the debias means and what the and what's the difference between the debias and uh, counterfactual? So this the second term is a bias. It's a pure language bias, right? Right. We have discussed and you are minusing the bias from the full model. It means you're right. debiasing it. But this and is so a, the CSS is intervening the training distributions, so it's also considered as a debiasing technique. Well, what do you mean intervening the training distribution? It's like this. It's like reweighting and uh, counterfeit the training samples, right? You are manipulating the training data. Intervening the train data. 
you are changing the visual parts and you are changing the language parts. You are rebalancing the training data and therefore the resultant model will be debugged. Do I clarify myself? Okay. So this All is right. the your previous define. This is the C bar or C bar. So you give an equation F C right here? Yeah, F C bar Q. And this C bar before you said this is zero. And now you create a new C bar, which is you introduce so you mask some part. So you add some augmentation how to no, 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 no. That's that one. That example you have seen is interventions. It's a different technique. There are two techniques in in a causal view can debars. The first one is interventions. You are intervening the training data themselves. And the second one is about counterfactuals. You are imagining a whole new world which is a bias and you minus this bar there are two there are two camps so your paper okay. combine these two together or yes in a causal lens we combine them we we unify them in a unified view what does mean unify it's just minus one minus another one or yes Okay. We unify them. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thanks. All right. So, thank you. So, so all these debarsing methods, uh, although they may from the level two interventional level three counterfactual, they are manipulating. So, uh, so please recall that in the first slide we have a assumption that the test probability is different from the training OD. So any OD requires that uh, there's a assumption that the test distribution is different from the training, right? So this is about the debarsing. Why the most of the debarsing techniques works? But when we re-look really at these things, we may find that uh, the debars methods actually perform badly in the previous in distribution tasks. And this observation can be seen again in the long tail classifications. As you can see, that the red line is the conventional imbalanced models, and the blue lines are the uh, uh, balanced methods, or the debars ones. As you can see that when the test distribution is uniform, right, means uh, the number of the tail classes, the testing samples are of the same number of the head classes. So when your test is balanced, as you can see that the traditional imbalanced models will still preserve its long tail shape. And the uh, proposed balance measures will be mostly uniform, but it has a tail rise. So this tail rise means you are deliberately minus the bias. You are counter performing the bias in the test set. You want to uh, uh, discard the mainstream, right? The head effect. And But when your test is imbalanced, you can find that your red bars is still long tail. And your blue, the balanced models will be again mostly uniform and with a tail rise. So this means that when you are changing the distributions of the test, none of the models will follow the blue or the red none of them will follow the true distribution, the ground truth one of the test distributions. In meaning, they are very stubborn. 
they insist that I should perform the inductive virus that is injected in my model, right? So the blue is uniform shaped with the tail rise, and the red is the long tail shift. So this figure may show that maybe in the community that the long tail classification is never progressed. It's just playing a head and tail bias flip, right? So the, the so-called balance model is just the other side of the coin. And on the other side of the coin, it's imbalanced model. And the uh, other side of the coin is the balanced model. So it's just a, a bias flipping game. So our proposed one, the key point of today is trying to make a model in the blue, uh, in the green line that our model, once trained on the train set, it can uh, follow the true distribution of the test one. And that's what I call it truly unbiased. So let's see how. So we will first introduce the VQE model in a very intuitive ways and the long tail model in a more theoretical ways. So they are the same model, but in a VQA, we will uh, introduce the method in the knowledge distillation perspective, which is not that causal, but in the long-term classification case, I will use uh, more, more causal terms. Okay, so the goal is to make the best of the two worlds, right? So, Imagine that we have two representatives of the two worlds. The first one is the ID teacher. So it's a best performer uh, when the train and test are the same distributions. And it performs worse than the OD teacher when the train and test are different. So our goal is to learn a student that learns the best of the two teachers. So the key challenge is that how does the student know to whom she should follow when uh, when you can only see the training data, right? How do you judge that uh, whether the OD teacher and ID teacher's performance given only one training data? You cannot uh, leak the testing ones, right? So that's a key challenge. So therefore we propose the so-called introspections. So here are the example of the Tang Dynasty Emperor that uh, if you want to make the nation prosperous, you should listen to both sides of the chancellor, right? You should listen to both of them, not biased to any of them. So uh, we will uh, categorize the introspection in three cases. The first one is when the ID teacher, suppose we have two teachers, right? When the ID teacher's performance is too good to be true, too good to be true means it performs perfect compared to the ground truth in the training data. And the OD teacher is not so good. So in this case, you will listen to the OD teacher who is not that confident. So in QTV, imagine you're buying a house, right? When the salesman is trying to, is bragging that this house is very good and maybe you should not trust it, him because maybe the house is haunting, right? So when another salesman is tells you that the house is not as good as someone else, but the salesman is also a agent of this house, right? But he's trying to tell you that the goods and the best from the house, he's not that confident. So intuitively we should trust the, uh, the other salesman better. So here is a example. The question is, is that a electric oven right here? So it's hard to see, but why the IID teacher is quite confident, like it's 
90% sure yes. And the yes is the ground truth. The reason is in the training data, 90% of the is a, uh, this question type is about answering yes. That's the reason why the ID teacher who follows the training distribution can perform that it's yes. But the OD teacher, on the other hand, he is trying to uh, counterperform the training bars. He's minus these priors, right? So the answer of the yes and no will be diverse, right? So this means that the OD teacher is not that confident at the ID ones. So therefore, we will have a ratio right here. The cross entropy will measures the confidence of the teacher. So in the case one, we will listen to the model or the teacher that is not as confident as the other one. So for case two, it's opposite. So, it's vice versa. Professor John. So sure. here, here you mean, so the too good is because of the bias. So how, how you get this argument? So is how, how to prove. So if it's too good and this too good must come from the ID uh, co must come from the bias. So how to get this? Because uh, we're comparing. We're comparing the confidence with the ground truth. The ground truth is from the training data, right? So if the model's output is exactly the same as the training data, it's there's something should be wrong. But I, I don't get this part. So if if well, your prediction is equal to your ground truth, must something must be wrong. Why? Yes, it's overconfident. But how do you define the overconfidence? And how do you find the overconfidence must come from the bias? And this this part I, I still don't get it. Why? Oh, this is just a guess, and you do it, and the result becomes better, and you guess this is the case. Oh, there is a proof this is the case. There is a proof in the long tail case in a mathematical way, but here it's uh, intuitive illustrations, and it's not the guess. So imagine that you have two models. The first model is very confident on this case, and the other model is also correct, but it's not that dominating. So the first one must be the inductive bias of the ID one. It should be much larger than the OD one. So you said why you have two models yeah, one is yes. confident. The other one is not confident. Then, there. So they have some difference. They they are not agree to each other, and that difference in the disagreement comes from the different bias. Yes, different inductive bias. So why not? One model is not good, and the other model is so good and control so. I am, I'm assuming there's other assumptions behind this. Let's say if these two models are trained on the mm. data set with same amount of data, and these two models mm -hmm. have the same architecture. So, so it, it, it's something like this. Oh, so I, I still don't get it. Why you can guarantee this is come from the bias? Uh, well. I can guarantee that if the two models are with different architectures and different parameters, it means that the two different models have different inductive biases, right? Inductive biases means your assumptions of the models. If you insist that the model one is using parameter size one and model two uses parameter size two, then you have different inductive viruses. And these two different viruses can cause the two 
different confidence. That's natural. You okay, I think I, I I do not agree on this. So, but you can move forward. I I, I still feel right, there okay. should be there should be some paper to show and validate, and this is the case uh, rather than yes, just. I will validate it later. Okay, cool. Thank I'll you. Validate later. All right. So for the case two, it's opposite when your OD model is like, uh, so what color is a older man's shirt? We have a uh, older man here and a uh, older man here, right? So uh, the OD model is much pretty sh uh, short than the ID ones, right? The blue is more dominating than the ID's blue. So we will listen to the ID teachers. The reason is in the training, the white, black, the, the blue one is a very minor in the answer, in the color answer distributions. So the OD teachers in Dante bars is trying to counterperform this training bars because it will minus all this dominating heads and therefore the minority will show up. That's why the OD shows blue. It's not the reason that OD teacher is seeing the, the truth from the image, but the answer is purely from the counterperform of this language bar. So in this case, we will listen to the ID teachers. So please remember that we will always listen to a model that is not so sure about the ground truth. All right. So K3 is uh, they are about the same. So we listen to both of them. So here is this overall architectures. We have the question and image input and we call it causal teachers because we have unified that the, uh, the, the, all the debarsing methods means the OD teachers are in fact a uh, 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 causal point of view. So we have the two outputs from the ID ones and the OD ones, and we compare with the ground truth. We call it introspection. And we have the two weights we have just discard it here. So the weight is uh, uh, if ID is more confident than OD, we should listen to the less confident one. And then we will merge where we call it blend this to uh, logic, the two outputs, and we have this so-called uh, teacher's output or the blended knowledge. So this knowledge represents the best of the two words. And we will have a student model to learn from this knowledge. And we will use this student model to perform the inference. So I will skip the uh, uh, analysis of the W. So maybe I can leave this in the follow up section. All right, so I will want to show that the, the Result is that the indeed uh, match the best of the two words. As you can see, that the uh, debars models they will all uh, improve that the VQA's JP's ones compared to the baselines, right? And but it will decrease the performance compared to the original ID distributions and we can improve them all right okay so now we go to a more theoretical point of view uh, recall that for the long tail classifications in the community all the models they are not just debarsing they are only trying to play a bias fleet game right so the uh, how to bring out that the model is truly learning the 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 learn 
something from the training data, we should look at the uh, features. So here, the figures on the left hand side is uh, examples of the uh, um, any of the shelf debars methods. As you can see that the features are not touched. The features are still uh, biased to the long tail distributions. And the, the, the classes on the top and the classes on the bottom are the head and the tails. So we are using a decreasing order of the uh, frequencies in the training data. And as you can see that uh, our models uh, can can improve the separations of the features. And later in the experiments, we will show that the uh, the proposed truly unbiased models truly learns the features better. So if the features are better, it, it means that the models is not playing the inductive bias game because the features are really good. All right. So of course we follow the same thing. The first one is we train the imbalance models at the factual models. And then we uh, train another balance classifiers as the counterfactual models because the counterfactual models are imagining the all of distributions. Because the training distribution is long tailed, the training distributions inductive bias is this head dominates the tail. And the counterfactual model's assumption is that the output should be flat, should be uniform, should be. So this distribution is different from this one, right? And then that's a weight. Uh, here is a detailed implementations of the two weights. If the factual models is uh, not that confident, I means the cross entropy compared with the ground truth is much higher, then we should listen to the models that is not confidence, aka the loss is higher. And the counterfactual weight is on the upper this side of the factual weight. And then we just merge the empirical loss like this, and we train the model. That's all. So what is the theories behind this uh, loss blending? So here, let's introduce the selection bar. Selection bars is like, this. So an um, example is that, uh, for example, if a guy is very uh, hardworking, right? Hardworking and talented can lead to both lead to success. And you observe that. So here is the observations. You observe that the guy is successful and you know that the guy is hardworking. So your bias is what? your bias will be that, oh, this guy may be not that talented, right? And for example, if you, another example, if you find a good looking guy and the rich is right here. And if you find that this is beauty, right? This example is in the post book. If you observe that a very ugly man is, uh, carrying a very beautiful lady. And then you must know that, oh, this man must be very rich, right? So the good looking and the rich has a negative correlations due to the observation of the fact of the common results. So the observations of the common result may cause a correlation, a spurious correlations of the input and the output. So this is called the selection bars. And this bias is, uh, cannot be easily removed from the training because you are training your models on the training data. You cannot, you are always observing the training data while you are pursuing the causal relationship from the X and Y. So the 
uh, long tail virus and the counterfactual VQA virus, they are also the result of the selection virus. Because uh, it, if you want to truly perform, pursue a truly unbiased model, you have to remove the selection bars introduced by the training data. So how to remove this bars? So we should, the first step is to apply the Reichenbach principle that if two variables have correlations and it must uh, be due to three cases. The first one is uh, X lead to Y and or Y lead to X. And the third case is that there is a common cause of X and Y. So we will rewrite the graph in A to graph in B. So graph B is a redrawing of the A, right? Of the training process of any models. And then as you can see that this graph has two backdoors. The backdoor one is the X and Y and the backdoor two is the X to X. So to remove the backdoor or the spurious correlations between X and Y, we need to perform the dual operators. It means we can cut off the links uh, uh, directing to X. It's been cut off. That's the illustrative uh, drawing of the dual operators. And then here is the mass. So we well the 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 bound of this the error bound of this uh, empirical risk minimization is illustrated in this paper. And this paper is from the the two students graduated from pros. And I believe that this method is a very good connection between the traditional caudal methods and the machine learning ones. And it has a very nice analysis of the error bound. So our model is a, 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 a more generalized re-implementations of this one. So here is the risk. Uh, hi, so uh, Han when you want to... uh, hi, Hanwan. Yeah, so I think uh, we still have some sessions uh, waiting uh, after this talk. So I'm wondering whether you yeah. can okay. probably finish it uh, maybe at uh, 5 30. Uh, 5 30. Oh, sure. Yeah, sure. 5 30. Yeah, 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 yeah. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah. okay, no problem. So the risk will be written like this. And you will, so please pay attention to this uh, do intervention distributions, right? So it's not just a normal post theory because this is from the fact, but this one is not from the fact. You can never observe a intervened world like this. So when you expand the loss in the empirical risk, this guy is quite tricky. So how to remove this one? Then we can apply the back door right here. The back door is a very nice uh, reduction from the intervened imaginative words to the factual world. So if you apply the back door uh, expansion, you can see that this term and this term can always be observed from the training data. So uh, in my opinion, that the backdoor adjustment is like a wormhole that connecting the two universes. Universe one is the factual world, the observational data. And universe two is the imaginative interventional distributions right here. So universe one is this one, Universe two is this one, okay? And please pay attention to this uh, PX given as here. This is the key that the inverse probability of this term is the key why we should listen to the ID teacher and the OD teacher. All right, so when you 
expand this and substitute this very long term into here, you will have this mass like this. So first, this is a log. OK, loss one and loss two. Loss one is from the factual sample, right? When the S is one means it's selected. It's in the it's selected and drawn from the training data. And when the S is zero, it means uh, kind of virtual and counterfactual samples. It's imagined from the OD teacher, from the counterfactual models. It's never seen. So uh, in fact, in our team, we are also investigating the relationship. In this framework, we are trying to connect the so-called smooth label knowledge distillation or some virtual sample knowledge distillation. And I believe that the, there should be some theoretical uh, grounds of the knowledge distillations in a uh, causal point of views. And then here is a weight. So this weight means if the sample, if the probability of the sample is drawn from the training data, means it's very confident that the factual models is drawing the samples from the training data, means its loss is uh, very small, then the weight should be very small. So that is the very counterintuitive and uh, challenged by that gentleman that the, 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 the more confidence of the uh, one model, the less you should listen to that one. So that's the magic here. And it's uh, fully theoretically grounded, right? So here's the... Hi, Professor John. Could you go to the previous slides? Yes. I'm trying to understand this. So here, so you have one is uh, OOD and one is ID. What's the meaning of S here? S equal to one means this sample is selected from the training data. S is zero means it's an imaginative one because you will never see the testing data. So S equal to one means you see this data in the training set, and S equal to zero means you didn't see yes. this in the training set. Yes. Yes, it's a counterfactual one, virtual one. So how does this relate to the, so if it's not happened, so then you use the OOD. So I, yes. How do you mean, how do you know it's, it's from the OOD? It has not seen this before, seen this sample before. OOD doesn't mean no overlap, right? Out of distribution, the distribution are different. But doesn't mean this image not yet in the training set. The output, it, it well, uh, how do I put this? Means you are trying to get the Y, the output of the model from a never seen distribution. So that's this what is OD. So, so S equal to, to zero means this is sample you haven't seen. Oh, you means out of this. So, out of, so before you said S equal to zero means you haven't seen this sample. And S equal to one yes. means you see this sample. But you see this sample, now see this sample different with the oh, distribution, right? You have a distribution on the same region, but you see this one, but you have di different distribution. So I, I still don't get it. Uh, so that two distributions could have overlap. That's one. If they're overlap, you see this. So there is a gap here. There, the the so so first the distribution we're talking about is not the x distribution. It's so the y the distribution. The output distribution. 
distribution one is x and y and s is from the training and distribution two is y s is not from the drawing or so because y, y the is the output of x so maybe you can also put s as a subscript of x here so what do you mean the y why is the uh, dictionary is the answer right yes so you it's mean Label. So that means you means the two data set has a totally different distribution over the vocabulary. Is this yes. what you mean? Yes. Okay. So if they have totally different distribution of vocabulary, so for example, the first data set has a lot of banana. The second data set has a uh, has very few banana, but it has a lot mm -hmm. of apples. So, uh -huh. so this means, and then you say, hey, if I, if you are very confident about banana because this distribution, this data set has a lot of banana, you should not uh, trust that. Yes. That's the result, yeah. And the reason is from here. It's like a reweighting of the factual world and the counterfactual world. But it's trying to, well, I think we have limited time and I have a very nice uh, metaphor is that this model is trying to unify the opinions of two different people, right? I'm model one and you're model two, and apparently you do not trust my proposed methods, then you are from this counterfactual world. And I'm trying to, so I'm trained on my own experience and the factual model one, and I'm trying to use my causal models of your brain, your mechanism, and to get, to get what you're thinking. And then I'm trying to adjust our confidence of the same training examples. And then I try to blend our opinions and then we maybe we can draw the same conclusions. But does this also relate to the relationship between your task distribution and two input distributions? I, I'm exactly. Two input distribution. Why is all the uh, each teacher has a distribution? You have a test distribution. That's three distribution yeah. control, which you should. But I, but I didn't see. So here you just, I think here there's an assumption between the relationship of the test distribution and the two input distribution, and then yes. this align with your strategy. But what's that hidden yes. assumption is? The hidden assumption is that uh, the first assumption is, of course, your causal model is correct. Otherwise, you cannot make a perfect guess of the counterfactual. So is your that's test the only assumption you have. Is your test distribution is more like in the middle of these two, two input distributions? In the middle? What do you mean yeah. by in the middle? So theoretically, if your, let's say, if your Pass the distribution exactly equal to your first distribution, input distribution. You should use the first model all the time. And if your test distribution equal to your second distribution, you can use your second model all the time, right? Yes, yes, yes. So I want to choice that. Please continue. So I want to understand, but here you you describe your algorithm, but I didn't see the relationship between the task distribution and the pool input distribution because that will control which model you should trust more. So I'm, I don't get to what you mean. Uh, you're meaning that I did not specify the task distribution, right? 
Okay, uh, the test distribution is assumed right here, uh, balanced and imbalanced, right? This is the guess, the test distribution. The balance and the imbalance balanced. in terms of? The number of testing samples belonging to each class. Imbalance means when the train is long tail and your test is also long tail. And balance means the training is long tailed, but the testing is balanced, it's uniform. You have the equal chance of the testing sample. So what if you don't even know your test distribution? That's what happens in the in, in, you know, yes, wild, so right? you don't know your test. Yes, you you will never know what your test distribution is like. So that's why you have to imagine it. Use a counterfactual model. Well, imagine you're not. It's not going to work, right? So because uh, suppose no matter how many models, suppose you have two models right now, but then you're, you're, uh -huh. you're going to you you're going to test it somewhere. You know, for that scenario, perfect. That does not match any of the distributions. You cannot even imagine what, yes. what the distribution is going to be, right? So, yes, if you, uh... so it seems like the, the yeah. method you are showing yes. kind of assumes that you know what the target distribution is. So, if you don't know the, the target distribution, you cannot generate a, a, the model that would work well for this for the for this targeted distribution, right? Yes, exactly. Your your question is very punctual and exactly what I I will do in the future. But uh, from this model, as you can see, that the S is like a switch for the future possible distributions. If you can, so the the grand assumption that your causal model is one hundred percent correct. If your causal model of the world is correct, then you can always imagine any distribution you want, right? And then you can also blend this S from uh, zero to like N, and then you can have a perfect blending of the future distributions. Yeah, that's the ideal assumption, right? The, you, you never yes, know, that's the you can never figure out the causal, right? There's a but that's not possible, basically. Yes, right. yes. That the 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 grand challenge of the causal inference. So, but I think that's perfectly natural because think of our human beings, right? We have done experiments on the Earth and we discover the gravity laws, and we use such physical laws to send our to launch our spaceship to the Mars, right? So the so the assumption that the gravity laws or the physical laws on the Mars is identical to the Earth, but something may happen. The physical laws inside the black holes may be completely different, right? So uh, we will always need to modify our causal models <laughs> when we sure. gain enough observations, right? So that's exactly the same case here. Yeah, but that's the difference is that uh, in the Mars, that a gravity factor is not uh, computed statistically though. It's a uh, scientifically estimated. I mean, that's that's different. The way it's not a statistical, it's not a machine learning approach to estimate that, it, that it's G and the Mars, right? Uh huh. Yeah, yeah. There, <laughs> there's some difference. Mm. All right. Uh, so, uh, I think I will just skip the experimental results means it's unbiased. And I want to show that uh, our methods can truly improve the features um, performance consistency, meaning that we can, uh, we are truly improving the representation learnings when we are training on the long tail data and we can improve the uh, linear classification performance on the balance data. And that's all. I think I have completely missed the first session.
I'm sorry about that. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Hama, for the great talk. Yeah, I, I think this inspired a extensive uh, discussion. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 So uh, it's yeah, kind of a very, very interesting topic. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I, I would like to ask you, I have a question. So, yeah. Sure. Uh, so, first, I have a question is that so, because in the first work, you talk about a language prayer uh, in, in, in the uh, question in the visual clustering, uh, which we created as yet, right? So, so I, I'm curious about uh, whether this is a language prayer or it's a word prayer. So because as you, uh, you you point out, actually, for example, the water club, the banana. So usually uh, the banana we are seeing uh, as human beings actually are usually yellow, right? And then this will be reflected in the we create data set as well. And, uh, mm -hmm. and uh, as a result, you will see more answer yellow uh, rather than more answer uh, green, right? So is this just a purely a language prayer or a word prayer? Uh, well, I think word is a part of the language. Mm -hmm. So maybe it's still a language prior. And maybe by language, you mean the more comprehensive linguistic prior? Yeah, the language prior, uh, because you, you mentioned that you want to debarrass the, uh, the weekly model, right? Uh -huh. And by uh, by just to rule out the language prior, uh, by manners, the, the, the language prior uh, inside the yeah. weekly model. So, yes, so here, uh, yeah, just a high level uh, think about this. Uh, so mm. the language prior, uh, is it a real language prior or actually is a reflection of the word? So that, that's just, uh, just my high level question about, about this, oh. yeah. I think it might be uh, your case, the, the word correlations because uh, by language bias in the in this paper, we have two cases. The first one is what we call the good language bias. The good language bar is more comprehensive, like the question type. The model will always um, uh, take the full advantage of the question type to, mm -hmm. to narrow down the answer vocabulary, right? But the bad bias is that like the 90% of the bananas in the training is yellow and you wrongly correlate banana and yellow. Mm. Yeah. That's a word bias. Word bias. Yeah. Okay, I see. Which is bad. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And uh, for, for the second work, actually, I, I also have a hard question. So uh, you are trying to balance the best model and device model by distill the knowledge uh, to uh -huh. a student model, right? So at a high level, I would like to regard this model as a sort of, uh, because you are uh, you, you are imposing a kill divergence and loss between the PT and the PS, right? So yes. at, at a high level, it seems like you are constrained that the output uh, entropy of the PS actually is more uh -huh. uh, flattened, but not that flattened. So which means that it's a little bit similar, uh, at least to me, it's like a model that trying to uh, have adding a regularization on top of the across on top of entropy of the PS, uh, so that it yes. cannot be that flattened, but it should be a little PK as well. So just uh, find the balance something like that. So I'm curious about yes. whether you can directly do the student model training with this loss without any kind of distillation from the two other models, the factor and the counterfactual reasoning model. Uh, without what? Without, um, the, without the green part and the, uh, the, 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 uh, the, the left part and the middle part, you just uh, add the regularization on top of the PS to constrain the entropy of the output uh, distribution? Uh, with respect to a prior distribution shape. Yeah, yeah. For example, uh, you given the PGT and the given the PS, mm -hmm. you add some loss mm -hmm. to regularize, uh, for example, the 
uh, the pickiness or the flat uh, uniformness of the PS, oh, okay. something like that. Yeah. Well, that does not work uh, because you will never know the true shape of this. You know the 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 perfect shape of PT. Uh, but you have PT. to explicitly blend it. So you mean you you have to have a PT uh, here yes. to do yes. that thing. And uh, this two uh, this PT is from the uh, from the two models, the ID prediction yeah, from factual and the, yes, from factual okay. and factual. Yeah. Okay, but this and two please model, know that. Huh? Uh, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah. Please continue your question. Oh, sorry. I'm sorry. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, these two models actually are trained uh, with the same uh, model architecture, but with different. Uh, for example, the loss function. Uh, from different inductive bars. Where uh, this model, you can. Consider it's a vanilla BQE model without any debiasing technique. And this model is deliberately uh, adopted with a debars technique. I see. Where you can consider this is Ruby and this is a vanilla up down. Yeah. Okay, I see. Mm -hmm. And and please note that this weight is on the sample level. So someone challenged me that, oh, you're just uh, trading off between the two models, but the weight is not on the model level. It's on the sample model. You can never uh, use a brute force hyperparameter tuning for uh, the weights for every training sample. That would be crazy. Yeah. So mm -hmm. you can also consider that our model is a kind of sample specific uh, adaptive dynamic uh, re-weighting. Mm. Yeah. I see, I see. So that's the difference between, for example, what I just mentioned uh, with your model. So the, that oh, one okay. actually is is taken overall uh, on top of the whole data set instead of the uh, specific samples uh, individually, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Got it. Great. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Any more questions from the audience? Yeah. Okay. Uh, I think there, there are no more questions. And uh, I think uh, at six, uh, from six, uh, there are several discussion uh, sessions uh, for Hanwha. So sure. let's stop here and uh, thank you, uh, Han Wang, for this great uh, discussion and the great talk again. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you all. Thanks, thank Han Wang. Thank you so much. Thanks for a nice talk. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. And may I know the gentleman's name?